Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Following the recent suborbital tourist hops, there's been a lot of discussion about whether the participants should be called astronauts. There are plenty of people who think that it's cool enough to qualify and others who are, well, gatekeeping and trying to explain that this isn't real space flight. And you know, that is a legitimate question as to what makes you an astronaut or a cosmonaut or a taikonaut. I mean, you know, we've grown up with you know, these stories of space heroes like Gagarin and Armstrong, and we see these icons as clearly different from passengers who are paying money to take a short hop to space. So there's a lot of people out there trying to draw clear lines to differentiate between these. But you know, finding clear lines is kind of hard. And even the space companies involved are doing this in their own way. Blue Origin loves to point out that it uses the 100 kilometer threshold for space rather than Virgin's 50 mile version, which is the US threshold. And funnily enough, both of these are based on Theodore von Karman's work, but they were just rounded differently by different organizations. Either way, on the same day that Bezos flew into space, the FAA published uh, updated rules about who could qualify for commercial astronaut status. Specifically, the guidelines try to restrict it to active crew members directly involved in the safe operation of the vehicle. But it also makes it clear that the FAA has complete discretion on who can be awarded wings if nominated by people. And the rules actually make it sound like more people on the Virgin Galactic flight would qualify for commercial wings since they were all employees of the company, they all had jobs to do, and actually three of them have previously been awarded commercial astronaut wings by the FAA. Pilot Dave McKay, uh, Mike Masuke, and Beth Moses, who was their passenger in the February 2019 flight to space. Overall, a total of seven people have been awarded commercial astronaut wings, and all of them have flown in Spaceship One or Spaceship Two. The commercial astronaut wings take the form of a pin with the traditional wing designs on either side and a circular design in the middle and that would contain the astronaut symbol. The astronaut symbol itself, it dates back to the early days of the US space program. It's a shooting star with three trails coming out the back flying through a halo. And astronauts who completed training on the, you know, to qualify would get the silver pin and when they flew to space, they were eligible to get a gold version, although I hear that they actually had to pay $400 to get that. And when they get up to the space station, it's quite common for new uh, people in their first flight to actually get awarded the gold pin in space. Now, originally, the, so it, with the Mercury 7, they were given a different pin with the, like, the astrological symbol for Mercury and the number 7 in the minute, but in the middle. But as they switched over to Gemini and Apollo, they needed a more generic symbol. So anyway, these astronaut pins, they're designed for civilian clothing. You know, you'll wear them on the lapel of a suit. And they're distinct from astronaut wings, which are part of a military uniform. And the astronaut wings are actually different depending upon which branch of the armed forces is awarding them, depending upon you know, where the candidate astronaut comes from. The commercial wings are closer to the, these uh, wings rather than the astronaut pin. But anyway, coming back to the recent commercial flights, since the FAA can pick and choose, I actually won't be surprised to see Wally Funk uh, getting commercial wings on the strength of her long career in aviation and, and the support that she has there. Jeff Bezos actually could get you know, nominated. I mean, I'm sure he has plenty of friends there. And I guess he did pay for the safety system. So that's a major contribution. Branson, by the same token, might also end up qualifying. But as time goes on and more and more tourist flights happen, it's going to be harder and harder to justify anybody on these flights getting commercial astronaut wings, with the exception of the pilots on Spaceship Two. So anyway, this lack of certainty and qualifications is why both Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic are awarding their participants with wings of their own design. The Virgin design is like a pair of sycamore seeds with a globe and a little spaceship one ascending from it. Blue Origin's design is the shape of the letter A with the sides representing the road to space and the crossbar being the feather from the Blue Origin's logo. Anyway, beyond the FAA commercial astronaut wings, there's just like a lot of discussion about how better to differentiate between tourists and real astronauts. And you'll notice I'm using finger quotes there because 
I think this hard distinction is really fuzzy. Any rules you pick will have flaws. I mean, some say these short hops are far too easy and you need to complete a, an orbit of the Earth before you can qualify as an astronaut. And that sounds great, except it excludes Yuri Gagarin, who landed just short of a complete orbit. And Gagarin, of course, would receive many honours for his flight, including Hero of the Soviet Union. I don't know much about the Soviet and Russian awards, to be honest. But OK, how about we just require orbital velocity? Let me tell you that in 1961, when Alan Shepard made a suborbital flight, the US was very insistent that that did indeed count, and Alan was very much an astronaut. And, you know, yeah, that also excludes suborbital flights by some really talented pilots who were in the X 15, Spaceship One, and Spaceship Two. Okay, so how about piloting being the differentiator, active roles in, in the flight? Well, as I pointed out, the only people who have actively controlled an ascent into space are those who have flown suborbital space planes. Yuri never touched the controls of Vostok 1. I mean, he'd been trained to do so in an emergency, but never needed to. The idea of an active crew member contributing to the mission is another way of seeking to exclude spaceflight participants, going so far as to suggest private spaceflight participants don't qualify. People like Dennis Tito, who was the first tourist to fly to the ISS and spend some time there. But you know, the space shuttle program also had many crew members who weren't fully trained astronauts. The payload specialists, they sometimes represented commercial partners who had hardware on the flight. Sometimes they were actual astronauts from another space agency. And sometimes they were politicians. The current administrator of NASA, Bill Nelson, flew on a space shuttle mission as a payload specialist. And he was jokingly refer referred to as Ballast Bill by many involved in the flight. And I hear he doesn't like it when people say that, so I guess I've ruined my chances of you know, NASA access for the next four years. But for all the talk, of raising the standards to try and exclude space tourists, NASA actually goes in a different direction. Candidates who complete astronaut training, they get to ref refer to as astronauts even before they fly in space. And I've heard that that might be because Deke Slayton spent so many years in charge of the astronaut office, unable to fly himself because of his medical condition. But he was still very much trained and qualified and referred to as an astronaut. Now, eventually his condition was remedied and because he was in charge of the astronaut office, he assigned himself to the final Apollo flight. And incidentally, Deke had a special astronaut pin made for him by the other astronauts. It was a gold pin with a diamond replacing the star. And he wore this until he got a proper gold one for his space flight. The pin was actually supposed to fly to space on Apollo 1, but tragically the accident meant that this never happened. I mean, okay, there were bigger tragedy of the accident than his pin, but yes, uh, it would it be awarded to him or presented to him by the widows of the crew of Apollo 1, one of whom was Roger Chaffee. And yeah, he was an astronaut and this would have been his first flight into space. And so he never flew into space. But you know, after his death, he was very much honoured as an astronaut. And there was other astronauts who have died before flying. One was Clifton Williams, and his silver pin was carried to the moon by Alan Bean on Apollo 12 and left there. And, you know, other uh, NASA astronauts would qualify and they would never end up on a flight for just, you know, other less dramatic reasons. I Yvonne Kegel is an astronaut I've met several times because she lives in the Bay Area. And she was selected as an astronaut in 1996, but never flew on a mission. And, you know, we still refer to her as an astronaut. And, you know, I also find out, by the way, there was a patch made for the League of Unflown Astronauts. This was established in 2014 and it commemorated in a patch with the name of all the astronauts who had yet to fly in space. And as they've all flown in space one at a time, the members are supposed to black out the names on the patch, uh, you know, with the, a sharpie. And the patch has later been modified to add cosmonauts around the outside, confirming that you don't actually have to fly in space to be considered an astronaut or a cosmonaut by your peers. 
There's also the Association of Space Explorers. This is an international organization founded in 1985 by Apollo astronaut Rusty Schweikert, along with cosmonauts Alexei Leonov, Vitaly Savatsiano, and uh, Georgi Greco. And while the membership is open to people who have completed one orbit of the Earth, they have recently created the Universal Astronaut Insignia pins for orbital and suborbital flights. And the difference is the orbital insignia has a ring in it to signify the orbit. Now, the pin is supposed to be like an international equivalent to the US astronaut pin and available to everyone around the world, everyone who has logged a space flight in some form. And one of these was flown to the space station recently with uh, Suichi Noguchi uh, to be presented to the family of Yuri Gagarin. So anyway, after all this, I don't actually have an easy answer to whether Jeff Bezos can call himself an astronaut. And frankly, I think it's less about the difference in the flight profile and more about the difference in training and experience needed for a proper long duration flight in space. And you know what? If Jeff really cares about it that much, then he should just hurry up, get new Glenn flying, and so then he can actually take a ride in orbit in that. And at least if he does that, we won't have so many jokes about genitals. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.